A Smile of Fortune by Joseph Conrad Chapter 2 I would have gladly dispensed with the mournful opportunity of becoming acquainted by sight with all my fellow captains at once. However, I found my way to the cemetery. We made a considerable group of bareheaded men in somber garments. I noticed that those of our company most approaching to the now obsolete sea-dog type were the most moved, perhaps because they had less manner than the new generation. The old sea-dog, away from his natural element, was a simple and sentimental animal. I noticed one who was facing me across the grave, who was dropping tears. They trickled down his weather-beaten face like drops of rain on an old rugged wall. I learned afterwards that he was looked upon as the terror of sailors, a hard man, that he had never had wife or chick of his own, and that, engaged from his tenderest years in deep sea voyages, he knew women and children merely by sight. Perhaps he was dropping those tears over his lost opportunities, from sheer envy of paternity and in strange jealousy of a sorrow which he could never know. Man, and even the seaman, is a capricious animal, the creature and the victim of lost opportunities. But he made me feel ashamed of my callousness. I had no tears. I listened with horribly critical detachment to that service. I had had to read myself once or twice over childlike men who had died at sea, the words of hope and defiance, the winged words so inspiring in the free immensity of water and sky, seemed to fall wearily into the little grave. What was the use of asking death where her sting was before that small dark hole in the ground? And then my thoughts escaped me altogether, away into matters of life, and no very high matters at that. Ships, freights, business, in the instability of his emotions, man resembles deplorably a monkey. I was disgusted with my thoughts, and I thought, shall I be able to get a charter soon? Time's money. Will that Jacobus really put good business in my way? I must go and see him in a day or two. Don't imagine that I pursued these thoughts with any precision. They pursued me, rather. Vague, shadowy, restless, shamefaced. Theirs was a callous, abominable, almost revolting pertinacity, and it was the presence of that pertinacious ship chandler which had started them. He stood mournfully amongst our little band of men from the sea, and I was angry at his presence, which, suggesting his brother before the merchant, had caused me to become outrageous to myself, for indeed I had preserved some decency of feeling. It was only the mind which... It was over at last. The poor father, a man of forty and black, bushy, side whiskers, and pathetic gash on his freshly shaven chin, thanked us all, swallowing his tears. But for some reason other because I lingered at the gate of the cemetery, being somewhat hazy as to my way back, or because I was the youngest, or ascribing my moodiness caused by remorse to some more worthy and appropriate sentiment, or simply because I was even more of a stranger to him than the others, he singled me out. Keeping at my side, he renewed his thanks, which I listened to in a gloomy, conscience-stricken silence. Suddenly he slipped one hand under my arm and waved the other after a tall, stout figure walking away by itself down a street in a flutter of thin, gray garments. That's a good fellow, a real good fellow, he swallowed down a belated sob, this Jacobus. And he told me in a low voice that Jacobus was the first man to board his ship on arrival, and learning of their misfortune had taken charge of everything, volunteered to attend to all routine business, carried off the ship's papers on shore, arranged for the funeral. A good fellow. I was knocked over. I had been looking at my wife for ten days, and helpless. 
just you think of that. The dear little chap died the very day we made the land. How I managed to take the ship, and God only knows. I couldn't see anything. I couldn't speak. I couldn't... You've heard, perhaps, that we lost our mate overboard on the passage. There was no one to do it for me, and the poor woman nearly crazy down below. They're all alone with the... By the Lord, it isn't fair. We walked in silence together. I did not know how to part from him. On the quay, he let go my arm and struck fiercely his fist into the palm of his other hand. By God, it isn't fair, he cried again. Don't you ever marry unless you can chuck the sea first. It isn't fair. I had no intention to chuck the sea. And when he left me to go aboard his ship, I felt convinced that I would never marry. While I was waiting at the steps for Jacobus's boatman, who had gone off somewhere, the captain of the Hilda joined me, a slender silk umbrella in his hand and the sharp joints of his archaic Gladstonian shirt collar, framing a small, clean-shaved, ruddy face. It was wonderfully fresh for his age, beautifully modeled and lit up by remarkably clear blue eyes, a lot of white hair, glossy like spun glass curled upwards slightly under the brim of his valuable ancient Panama hat with a broad black ribbon. In the aspect of that vivacious neat little old man there was something quaintly angelic and also boyish. He accosted me as though he had been in the habit of seeing me every day of his life from my earliest childhood with a whimsical remark on the appearance of a stout negro woman who was sitting upon a stool near the edge of the quay. Presently he observed amiably that I had a very pretty little bark. I returned the civil speech by saying readily, Not so pretty as the Hilda. At once the corners of his clear-cut sensitive mouth dropped dismally. Oh dear, I can hardly bear to look at her now. Did I know? He asked anxiously that he had lost the figurehead of his ship, a woman in a blue tunic edged with gold, the face perhaps not so very, very pretty, but her bare white arms beautifully shaped and extended as if she were swimming. Did I? Who would have expected such a things after twenty years, too? Nobody could have guessed from his tone that the woman was made of wood, his trembling voice, his agitated manner, gave to his lamentations a ludicrously scandalous flavor. Disappeared at night, a clear, fine night with just a slight swell in the Gulf of Bengal. Went off without a splash. No one in the ship could tell why, how, at what hour, after twenty years last October. Did I ever hear... I assured him sympathetically that I had never heard, and he became very doleful. This meant no good, he was sure. There was something in it which looked like a warning. But when I remarked that surely another figure of a woman could be procured, I found myself being soundly rated for my levity. The old boy flushed pink under his clear tan as if I had proposed something improper. One could replace masts, I was told, or a lost rudder, any working part of a ship. But where was the use of sticking up a new figurehead? What satisfaction? How could one care for it? It was easy to see that I had never been shipmates with a figurehead for over twenty years. A new figurehead, he scolded, an unquenchable indignation. Why... I've been a widower now for eight and twenty years, come next May, and I would just as soon think of getting a new wife. You're as bad as that fellow Jacobus. I was highly amused. What has Jacobus done? Did he want you to marry again, Captain? I inquired in a deferential tone, but he was launched now and only grinned fiercely. Procure, indeed. He's the sort of chap to procure you anything you like for a price. I hadn't been moored here for an hour when he got on board and at once offered to sell me a figurehead he happens to have in his yard somewhere. 
He got Smith, my mate, to talk to me about it. Mr. Smith, says I, don't you know me better than that? Am I the sort that would pick up another man's cast-off figurehead? And after all these years, too, the way some of you young fellows talk. I affected great compunction, and as I stepped into the boat, I said soberly, then I see nothing for it but to fit in a neat fiddlehead, perhaps. You know, carved scroll work, nicely gilt. He became very dejected after his outburst. Yes, scroll work, maybe. Jacobus hinted at that, too. He's never at a loss when there's any money to be extracted from a sailor man. You would make me pay through the nose for that carving. A gilt fiddlehead, did you say? Eh? I dare say it would do for you. You young fellows don't seem to have any feeling for what's proper. He made a convulsive gesture with his right arm. Never mind. Nothing can make much difference. I would just as soon let the old thing go about the world with a bear cut water, he cried sadly. Then as the boat got away from the steps, he raised his voice on the edge of the quay with comical animosity. I would, if only to spite that figure head procuring bloodsucker. I am an old bird here, and don't you forget it. Come and see me on board some day. I spent my first evening in port quietly in my ship's cuddy, and glad enough was I to think that the shore life which strikes one as so pettily complex, discordant, and so full of new faces on first coming from sea could be kept off for a few hours longer. I was, however, fated to hear the Jacobus note once more before I slept. Mr. Burns had gone ashore after the evening meal to have, as he said, a look around. As it was quite dark when he announced his intention, I didn't ask him what it was he expected to see. Sometime about midnight, while sitting with a book in the saloon, I heard cautious movements in the lobby and hailed him by name. Burns came in, stick and hat in hand, incredibly vulgarized by his smart shore togs, with a jaunty air and an odious twinkle in his eye. Being asked to sit down, he laid his hat and stick on the table, and after we had talked of ship affairs for a little while, I've been hearing pretty tales on shore about that ship chandler fellow who snatched the job from you so neatly, sir. I remonstrated with my late patient for his manner of expressing himself, but he only tossed his head disdainfully. A pretty dodge indeed, boarding a strange ship with breakfast and two baskets for all hands and calmly inviting himself to the captain's table. Never heard of anything so crafty and so impudent in his life. I found myself defending Jacobus's unusual methods. He's the brother of one of the wealthiest merchants in the port. The mate's eyes fairly snapped green sparks. His grandbrother hasn't spoken to him for eighteen or twenty years, he declared triumphantly. So there. I know all about that, I interrupted loftily. Do you, sir? Hmm. His mind was still running on the ethics of commercial competition. I don't like to see your good nature taken advantage of. He's bribed that steward of ours with a five-rupee note to let him come down. Or ten, for that matter. He don't care. He will shove that and more into the bill presently. Is that one of the tales you have heard ashore? I asked. He assured me that his own sense could tell him that much. No. What he had heard on shore was that no respectable person in the whole town would come near Jacobus. He lived in a large old-fashioned house in one of the quiet streets with a big garden. After telling me this, Burns put on a mysterious air. He keeps a girl shut up there, who, they say, I suppose you've heard all this gossip in some eminently respectable place, I snapped at him in a most sarcastic tone. The shaft told, because Mr. Burns, like many other disagreeable people, was very sensitive himself. He remained as if thunderstruck, with his mouth open for some further communication, but I did not give him the chance. And anyhow, what the deuce do I care, I added, 
retiring into my room, and this was a natural thing to say, yet somehow I was not indifferent. I admit it is absurd to be concerned with the morals of one's ship chandler, if ever so well connected, but his personality had stamped itself upon my first day in harbor in the way you know. After this initial exploit, Jacobus showed himself anything but intrusive. He was out in a boat early every morning going round the ships he served, and occasionally remaining on board one of them for breakfast with the captain. As I discovered that his practice was generally accepted, I just nodded to him familiarly one morning on coming out of my room. I found him in the cabin. Glancing over the table, I saw that his place was already laid. He stood awaiting my appearance, very bulky and placid, holding a beautiful bunch of flowers in his thick hand. He offered them to my notice with a faint, sleepy smile from his own garden. Had a very fine old garden. Picked them himself that morning before going out to business. Thought I would like. He turned away. Steward, can you oblige me with some water in a large jar, please? I assured him jocularly as I took my place at the table that he made me feel as if I were a pretty girl and that he mustn't be surprised if I blushed. But he was busy arranging his floral tribute at the sideboard. Stand it before the captain's plate, steward, please. He made this request in his usual undertone. The offering was so pointed that I could do no less than to raise it to my nose, and as he sat down noiselessly, he breathed out the opinion that a few flowers improved notably the appearance of a ship's salon. He wondered why I did not have a shelf fitted all round the skylight for f flowers and pots to take with me to see. He had a skilled workman able to make fit up shelves in a day, and he could procure me two or three dozen good plants. The tips of his thick round fingers rested composedly on the edge of the table on each side of his cup of coffee. His face remained immovable. Mr. Burns was smiling maliciously to himself. I declared that I hadn't the slightest intention of turning my skylight into a conservatory only to keep the cabin table in a perpetual mess of mold and dead vegetable matter. Rear most beautiful flowers, he insisted with an upward glance. It's no trouble, really. Oh, yes, it is. Lots of trouble, I contradicted. And in the end, some fool leaves the skylight open in a fresh breeze. A flick of salt water gets at them and the whole lot is dead in a week. Mr. Burns snorted a contemptuous approval. Jacobus gave up the subject passively. After a time, he unplugged his thick lips to ask me if I had seen his brother yet. I was very curt in my answer. No, not yet. A very different person, he remarked dreamily, and got up. His movements were particularly noiseless. Well, thank you, Captain. If anything is not to your liking, please mention it to your steward. I suppose you will be giving a dinner to the office clerks presently. For what? I cried with some warmth. If I were a steady trader to the port, I could understand it, but a complete stranger? I may not turn up again here for years. I don't see why. Do you mean to say it is customary? It will be expected from a man like you, he breathed out placidly. Eight of the principal clerks, the manager, that's nine. You three gentlemen, that's twelve. It needn't be very expensive if you tell your steward to give me a day's notice. It will be expected of me? Why should it be expected of me? Is it because I look particularly soft, or what? His immobility struck me as dignified suddenly. His imperturbable quality is dangerous. There is plenty of time to think about that, I concluded weakly, and with a gesture that tried to wave him away. But before he departed, he took time to mention regretfully that he had not yet had the pleasure of seeing me at his store to sample those cigars. He had a parcel of 6000 to dispose of, very cheap. I think it would be worth your while to secure some, he added with a fat, melancholy smile, and left the cabin. 
Mr. Burns struck his fist on the table excitedly. Did you ever see such impudence? He's made up his mind to get something out of you one way or another, sir. At once feeling inclined to defend Jacobus, I observed philosophically that all this was business, I supposed. But my absurd mate, muttering broken, disjointed sentences such as, I cannot bear, mark my words, and so on, flung out of the cabin. If I had nursed him through that deadly fever, I wouldn't have suffered such manners for a single day. A Smile of Fortune by Joseph Conrad Chapter 3 Jacobus, having put me in mind of his wealthy brother, I concluded I would pay that business call at once. I had by that time heard a little more of him. He was a member of the city council, where he made himself objectionable to the authorities. He exercised a considerable influence on public opinion. Lots of people owed him money. He was an importer on a great scale of all sorts of goods. For instance, the whole supply of bags for sugar was practically in his hands. This last fact I did not learn till afterwards. The general impression conveyed to me was that of a local personage. He was a bachelor, and gave weekly card parties in his house out of town, which were attended by the best people in the colony. The greater, then, was my surprise to discover his office in his shabby surroundings, quite away from the business quarter, amongst a lot of hovels. Guided by a blackboard with white lettering, I climbed a narrow wooden staircase and entered a room with a bare floor of planks littered with bricks of brown paper and wisps of pecking straw. A great number of what looked like wine cases were piled up against one of the walls. A lanky, inky, light yellow mulatto youth, miserably long-necked and generally recalling a sick chicken, got off a three-legged stool behind a cheap deal desk and faced me as if gone dumb with fright. I had some difficulty in persuading him to take in my name, though I could not get from him the nature of his objection. He did it at last with an almost agonized reluctance which ceased to be mysterious to me when I had heard him being sworn at menacingly with savage suppressed growls then audibly cuffed and finally kicked out without any concealment whatever because he came back flying head foremost through the door with a stifled shriek to say i was startled would not express it i remained still like a man lost in a dream clapping both his hands to that part of his frail anatomy which had received the shock the poor wretch said to me simply Will you go in, please? His lamentable self-possession was wonderful, but it did not do away with the incredibility of the experience. A preposterous notion that I had seen this boy somewhere before, a thing obviously impossible, was like a delicate finishing touch of weirdness added to a scene fit to raise doubts as to one's sanity. I stared anxiously about me like an awakened somnambulist, I say, I cried loudly, there isn't a mistake, is there? This is Mr. Jacobus's office. The boy gazed at me with a pained expression and somehow so familiar. A voice within growled offensively, Come in, come in, since you were there, I didn't know. I crossed the outer room as one approaches the den of some unknown wild beast with intrepidity, but in some excitement. Only no wild beast that ever lived would rouse one's indignation, the power to do, that belongs to the odiousness of the human brute. And I was very indignant, which did not prevent me from being at once struck by the extraordinary res resemblance of the two brothers. This one was dark instead of being fair like the other, but he was as big. He was without his coat and waistcoat. He had been doubtless snoozing in the rocking chair, which stood in a corner furthest from the window. Above the great bulk of his crumpled white shirt, buttoned with three diamond studs, his round face looked swarthy, 
It was moist. His brown mustache hung limp and ragged. He pushed a common cane-bottomed chair towards me with his foot. Sit down. I glanced at it casually. Then, turning my indignant eyes full upon him, I declared in precise and incisive tones that I had called in obedience to my owner's instructions. Oh, yes, hmm, I didn't understand what that fool was saying. But never mind, it will teach that scoundrel to disturb me at this time of the day, he added, grinning at me with savage cynicism. I looked at my watch, it was past three o'clock. Quite the full swing of afternoon office work in the port. He snarled imperiously, sit down, captain. I acknowledged the gracious invitation by saying deliberately, I can listen to all you may have to say without sitting down. Emitting a loud and vehement pshaw, he glared for a moment, very round-eyed and fierce. It was like a gigantic tomcat spitting at one suddenly. Look at him. What do you fancy yourself to be? What did you come here for? If you won't sit down and talk business, you had better go to the devil. I don't know him personally, I said, but after this I wouldn't mind calling on him. It would be refreshing to meet a gentleman. He followed me, growling behind my back. The impudence. I've got a good mind to write your honors, what I think of you. I turned on him for a moment. As it happens, I don't care. For my part, I assure you, I won't even take the trouble to mention you to them. He stopped at the door of his office while I traversed the littered anteroom. I think he was somewhat taken aback. I will break every bone in your body, he roared suddenly at the miserable mulatto lad, if you ever dare to disturb me before half past three for anybody. Do you hear? For anybody. Let alone any damn skipper, he added in a lower growl. The frail youngster, swaying like a reed, made a low moaning sound. I stopped short and addressed the sufferer with advice. It was prompted by the sight of a hammer, used for opening the wine cases, I suppose, which was lying on the floor. If I were you, my boy, I would have that thing up my sleeve when I went in the next time, and at the first occasion I would. What was there so familiar in that lad's yellow face? Entrenched and quaking behind the flimsy desk, he never looked up. His heavy, lowered eyelids gave me suddenly the clue of the puzzle. He resembled, yes, those thick, glued lips. He, re he resembled the brothers Jacobus. He resembled both the wealthy merchant and the pushing shopkeeper, who resembled each other. He resembled them as much as a thin, light, yellow mulatto lad may resemble a big, stout, middle-aged white man. It was the exotic complexion and the slightness of his build which had put me off so completely. Now I saw in him, unmistakably, the Jacobus strain, weakened, attenuated, diluted, as it were, in a bucket of water, and I refrained from finishing my speech. I had intended to say, crack this brute's head for him. I still felt the conclusion to be sound, but it is no trifling responsibility to console parricide to anyone, however deeply injured. Beggarly, cheeky skippers. I despise the emphatic growl at my back, only, being much vexed and upset, I regret to say that I slammed the door behind me in a most undignified manner. It may not appear altogether absurd if I say that I brought out from that interview a kindlier view of the other Jacobus. It was with a feeling resembling partisanship that, a few days later, I called at his store, that long cavern-like place of business, very dim at the back, and stuffed full of all sorts of goods, was entered from the street by a lofty archway. At the far end I saw my Jacobus exerting himself in his shirt sleeves among his assistants. The captain's room was a small vaulted apartment with a stone floor and heavy iron bars in its windows, like a dungeon converted to a hospitable purposes. 
A couple of cheerful bottles and several gleaming glasses made a brilliant cluster around a tall, cool, red earthenware pitcher on the center table which was littered with newspapers from all parts of the world. A well-groomed stranger in a smart gray check suit sitting with one leg flung over his knee put down one of these sheets briskly and nodded to me. I guessed him to be a steamer captain. It was impossible to get to know these men. They came and went too quickly and their ships lay moored far out. At the very entrance of the harbor there was another life altogether. He yawned slightly. Dull hole, isn't it? I understand this to allude to the town. Do you find it so? I murmured. Don't you? But I'm off tomorrow, thank goodness. He was a very gentlemanly person, a good-natured and superior. I watched him draw the open box of cigars to his side of the table, take a big cigar case out of his pocket, and begin to fill it very methodically. Presently, on our eyes meeting, he winked like a common mortal and invited me to follow his example. They are really decent smokes. I shook my head. I am not off tomorrow. What of that? Think I am abusing old Jacobus's hospitality? Heavens, it goes into the bill, of course. He spreads such little matters all over his account. He can take care of himself. Why, it's business. I noted a shadow fall over his well-satisfied expression, a momentary hesitation in closing his cigar case, but he ended by putting it in his pocket jauntily, a placid voice uttered in the doorway. That's quite correct, Captain. The large, noiseless Jacobus advanced into the room. His quietness in the circumstances amounted to cordiality. He had put on his jacket before joining us, and he sat down in the chair vacated by the steamer man, who nodded again to me and went out with a short, jarring laugh. A profound silence reigned. With his drowsy stare, Jacobus seemed to be slumbering open-eyed. Yet somehow I was aware of being profoundly scrutinized by those heavy eyes. In the enormous cavern of the store, somebody began to nail down a case expertly. Tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Two other experts, one slow and nasal, the other shrill and snappy, started checking an invoice. A half coil of three inch manila rope, right. Six assorted shackles, right. Six tins assorted soups, three of pate, two asparagus, fourteen pounds of tobacco, cabin, right. It's for the captain who was here just now, breathed out the immovable Jacobus. These steamer orders are very small, they pick up what they want as they go along. That man will be in Semarang in less than a fortnight. Very small orders indeed. The calling over of the items went on in the shop. An extraordinary jumble of varied articles, paintbrushes, Yorkshire relish, etc., etc. Three sacks of best potatoes, read out the nasal voice. At this, Jacobus blinked like a sleeping man roused by a shake and displayed some animation. It is order, shouted into the shop, a smirking half-caste clerk, with his ringlets much oiled, and with a pen stuck behind his ear, brought in a sample of six potatoes, which he paraded in a row on the table. Being urged to look at their beauty, I gave them a cold and hostile glance. Calmly, Jacobus proposed that I should order ten or fifteen tons. Tons! I couldn't believe my ears. My crew could not have eaten such a lot in a year, and potatoes, excuse these practical remarks, are a highly perishable commodity. I thought he was joking, or else trying to find out whether I was an unutterable idiot. But his purpose was not so simple. I discovered that he meant me to buy them on my own account. I am proposing you a bit of business, Captain. I wouldn't charge you a great price. I told him that I did not go in for trade. I even added grimly that I knew only too well how that sort of specialty generally ended. 
He sighed and clasped his hands on his stomach with exemplary resignation. I admired the placidity of his impudence. Then waking up somewhat, Won't you try a cigar, Captain? No thanks, I don't smoke cigars. For once, he exclaimed in a patient whisper. A melancholy silence ensued. You know how sometimes a person discloses a certain unsuspected depth and acuteness of thought that is, in other words, utters something unexpected. It was unexpected enough to hear Jacobus say, The man who just went out was right enough. You might take one, Captain. Here everything is bound to be in the way of business. I felt a little ashamed of myself. The remembrance of his horrid brother made him appear quite a decent sort of fellow. It was with some compunction that I said a few words to the effect that I could have no possible objection to his hospitality. Before I was a minute older, I saw where this admission was leading me. As if changing the subject, Jacobus mentioned that his private house was about ten minutes' walk away. It had a beautiful, old, walled garden, something really remarkable. I had to come round some day and have a look at it. He seemed to be a lover of gardens. I, too, take extreme delight in them. But I did not mean my compunction to carry me as far as Jacobus's flower beds however beautiful and old. He added with a certain homeliness of tone, There is only my girl there. It is difficult to set everything down in due order, so I must revert here to what happened a week or two before. The medical officer of the port had come on board my ship to have a look at one of my crew who was ailing, and naturally enough he was asked to step into the cabin. A fellow shipmaster of mine was there too, and in the conversation, somehow or other, the name of Jacobus came to be mentioned. It was pronounced with no particular reverence by the other man, I believe. I don't remember now what I was going to say. The doctor, a pleasant, cultivated fellow with an assured manner, prevented me by striking in a sour tone. Ah, you're talking about my respected papa-in-law. Of course, that Sally silenced us at the time. But I remembered the episode, and at this juncture, pushed for something non-committal to say. I inquired with polite surprise, You have your married daughter living with you, Mr. Jacobus? He moved his big hand from right to left quietly. No, that was another of his girls. He stated ponderously and under his breath as usual. She, he seemed in a pause to be ransacking his mind for some kind of descriptive phrase. But my hopes were disappointed. He merely produced his stereotype definition. She's a very different sort of person. Indeed. And by the by, Jacobus, I called on your brother the other day. It's no great compliment if I say that I found him a very different sort of person from you. He had an air of profound reflection, then remarked quaintly, He's a man of regular habits. He might have been alluding to the habit of late siesta, but I mumbled something about beastly habits anyhow, and left the store abruptly.